Good evening. Let's turn to Psalm 17. The Lord said that His word will not return to Him void, and He'll accomplish that which pleases Him. I need to remember that. If I say His word, I think what I want it to accomplish. And I aim over here, He may be pleased to hit over there. He's going to do with His word as He sees fit. Uh, Brother Bob <clears throat> was trying to make it with us today. Uh, his wife, Vicki, had to undergo surgery today. and She ought to be home Friday. And so, uh, as you can remember him. But <clears throat> the title of this message here is A Lesson in Prayer. Psalm 17. I want to work through this psalm, and I just want to look at some of the highlights and make some comments with you. Uh, when I was a little child, I had to be taught how to do everything. Some things were instinctive. I knew how to swallow, I knew how to eat a little bit of food, drink a little bit of water, but that took some learning too. I had to have some encouragement and guidance in that. And some better instruction, I'd learned to chew with my mouth closed. I'd learned how to use a fork like this, and how to drink at night with my hands, how to use a napkin. I had to be taught those things. The Lord has to teach His children everything. We have faith. He gives us that, it's His faith, but He has to teach us how to walk by it. Just like a baby has to learn how to walk. It's got legs. They don't know how to walk. You have to teach it. We love. We have His love in us, but we have to be shown what love does. He has to teach us how to love. How we learn that? By seeing how He ex exposes to us how He's loved us. We sing. But we need to be taught through trials how to sing from the heart. Quit pretending and start singing from the heart. He has to show us that. He has to teach that. We read in Luke 11, verse 1, the disciples heard him praying, and he ceased praying, and they said, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. We pray, but we must be taught how to pray, just like everything else. And I want to learn more about how to pray in times of trouble. Those seem more often. That seems easier, don't it? But I need to learn better. I need to learn how to pray more often in times of joy. There I'm lacking. I need to learn how to pray in times of thanksgiving, in times of rest. Uh, when the sun's just hitting you just right and a cool breeze hits you coming the other way. Uh, ain't work's done for the day. I need to learn how to pray then. The Lord has to teach those things. Here in Psalm 17, it's titled David's Prayer. David had some enemies. We do too. We have enemies either in people or what we think is trials and providence that are against us. Trials in this frail body we're trapped in. Enemy of our own emotions. Our own thoughts running wild in our minds. And we can learn a lot by our older brother David here as he prays. He prays throughout the Psalms. I had a great week to dwell on these things. How, how quick I am to complain about my week. Oh, my back hurts. and This and that and the other. It's been a hard week. It's been a hard... Has it? Has it really been a hard week? Well, the oven quit working. We had a fender bender. My well pump caught on fire. Uh, I thought I spooked our black and white cat last night when it was dark, but it wasn't. It was a skunk. And it just about, just about run in the house. And I was yelling for Kimberly to open the other door, but I wasn't clear on which door, so the dog almost got out to get it. Uh, I hurt my leg real bad. <laughs> it's sore right now. My computer crashed this evening right as we was getting a live feed on. And I only had to preach five more times this week. <laughs> Be easy to sit down and go, whoo hoo, woe is me. That's my instinct. Throw a pity party with balloons and, and rides and a petting zoo. What a beautiful, wonderful time for the Lord to teach me something. That sounds so good until you're just at your wits end and you can't breathe. Then you prime for him to teach you something. Old writer said one time, I cannot tell if we owe more to our enemies than our friends. If we owe more to our failures or our successes, more to headache than to joy. He couldn't tell, but I can tell you this. A tree grows and bears more fruit when it's fertilized. That doesn't smell good, does it? It grows and bears more fruit when it's pruned regularly and when it's purged, when it's washed, when it's scrubbed down. I know that. 
David here, he was overwhelmed, he was outnumbered, he was outmatched, and whatever trial it was, we're not told. And how, how beautiful and how wise that is for our Lord to give us these things and not give us too much information. That way we can enter into it. We don't feel like an outcast and we don't feel more important than what we think we are. He says here in verse 5, he says, Hold up my goings in thy paths, and my footsteps slip not. That means they don't waver. Don't let my footsteps stumble. Don't let me fall away. Lord, hold me up. But he ends verse 15. Here's assurance and confidence. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I wake with thy likeness. Now what is the path the Lord walks His sheep down to go from fearing of falling away, fearing of stumbling, wavering, to complete assurance. What path does He walk us down to go from Lord keep me to Lord I know you'll keep me. You shall keep me. I shall see you. I shall be made like you. There may be some on the road of faith and just not realize it. We'll see. I hope we can see that. Well let's start where David started. How can we learn this journey? Look at verse 1. Hear the right O oh Lord, attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of feigned lips. He says, hear the right. Who's right? Christ is right, isn't he? He's our righteousness. Hear Christ, the Lord, my righteousness. You ever end a prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Desperation will make us begin with His name. Not just end with it, not out of routine, not out of fashion, not out of form, out of, 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 of repetitious bodily exercise, but desperation will make us begin with Him. Because that's where the Father began with, was with the Son, wasn't it? Beginning in Him, begging to be found in Him. Because that's the only way we can come to the Father, is in Him. Now, Pastor, you say these psalms are bifocal. <laughs> it applies to the Lord on this earth as he walked this earth. This is what he prayed. This applies to David. David went through this. He experienced it. He says it, and we who believe, we can too. The Syriac version reads this way, Hear, O Holy Lord. That's who David's praying to. That's who we pray to. We cry to him. Attend. Hearken, be attentive unto my cry and give ear unto my prayer. This cry, this prayer, it doesn't go out of feigned lips. This ain't fake. This ain't pretend. This is not a routine. It's a cry. It's a cry. It's a cry. And it ain't a routine. You get that? I schedule things throughout my day. I water my garden every morning from about 7 to 7.30 a.m. That's the time I have devoted, play on words, to the garden. Do I set a scheduled time period in the end of the day or the beginning of the day to accomplish all of my crying? You see a sad commercial or something, you see a little child suffering, you say, oh, well, I was going to cry, but my crying don't start till 7.30. I will devote this time to crying. <laughs> Do we have a devotional time for crying? I hope not. <laughs> I hope we don't. Why? Because we, if I could only cry, have water come out of my eyes for an allotted period of day, or mo that's most of the time, well, that's just rigidity. That's not necessity, is it? That's not, why would I pray in such a way? Why would I commit my time of reading of the, work, the, the Lord's Word? Should we be consistent? Yeah, we should. But is it a routine? It's religion, isn't it? Or is it a necessity? When do we cry? We cry out when it hurts. <laughs> Or when our joy and love overwhelms us. That's when we cry. Physically cry out, don't we? Crying out, praying to a holy God in sincerity, we do it because of Christ. Just like Onesimus, bringing that letter from Paul to Philemon. Well, now, former master Philemon, i got a lot to tell you. Let me explain to you. No, he just said, here. <laughs> Read it. <laughs> Intercession. Pardon. That's what he said. One of them. Hear the right, O Lord. Attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of feigned lips. 
what David's bringing to the Lord in prayer, he wants the Lord to judge it. He doesn't want other men to make a decision for him because of who he's praying to. He doesn't want somebody else to tell him it's okay. He doesn't want someone else to have a verdict. He doesn't want himself to have a verdict to figure this out. He wants the Holy God to give a verdict on what he's praying. He did not pray about a decision he had made. <laughs> when the Lord, I've made a decision, I want you to get back with me and let me know if it's okay. He wanted to hear about the decision the Lord had made. Be reminded again about His words and not our words. Look at in verse 2. Let my sentence, my verdict, come forth from thy presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. He's saying, look upon me in Christ and His righteousness and you declare your verdict. That don't sound that theologically deep, does it? Lord, look at me in your Son and tell me about it one more time. Tell me there's no condemnation. Tell me He's paid for my sin. That He became me and I've been made Him and I'm one with Him. Let my case be decided from Your throne. From Your presence. That's what we need, isn't it? I cannot tell you you're saved. <laughs> the one that saves can. You know that? Only one who tries to convince a lost man he's saved is another lost man. Oh, no, 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 we got this. I can tell. The same one that revealed to you that you were lost is the same one that will do the work of revealing that you're found. And if he's begun the work, he'll finish the work. If somebody else has, uh, anybody can finish it. <laughs> if he's begun it, he'll finish it. Believers can encourage one another. But only our great Redeemer can speak to the heart effectually. effectually. How can I put that in shoe leather for you? How can I explain that in a way that you can understand it? And I can understand it. Even when it's from a pure heart. Someone could tell me that Kimberly loves me. They could remind me of all the things she has done for me. They can remind me of, of the multitude of things she's given up to be with me, to be my wife. They could remind me of the children that we have. The fruit that's, that's come from us. How she loves them. How she cares for them too. That could be nice, wouldn't it? But I need to hear it from her. You get that? I can tell you some things. You need to hear it from the Lord. I need to hear it from her. I need to hear it from Him. I need to hear it from the Lord that He loves me. How do you and I hear this sentence, this verdict from the Lord? How did, could David hear it? You sit underneath the preaching of the gospel. I always use six months, that's half a year, I guess. If you've got questions and you've got concerns, be underneath the preaching of the gospel consistently. Now, it may take six days, six weeks, six months, or six years, I don't know. But the Lord's going to answer all the questions that you have, all the concerns that you have. And it ain't going to take an abacus, and it ain't going to take a thesaurus to figure it out. I won't know what it is, or whoever you're sitting under won't know who it is, but the Lord will and you will. He'll speak to you. That verdict will come down. He'll deal with it. Well, what about this? Well, if the Lord started to work, you don't have to be saved tonight. He'll finish it. He'll keep you till He's finished with you. He said, let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. Job worded it this way. Let me be weighed in an even balance. An even balance. We'll look here in a couple of Sundays. Abraham said, shall not the judge of the earth do right? His balances are equal. <laughs> They're even. I want to hear a word from you. I want it to be just, and I want equality. People cry about that for 20 years in this country, ain't they? I want to be equal with your son. I want to be united with him. That's what I want. I want to be on the scales and be with him. Once we hear the verdict, once we're told we're found in him, is that it? One and done. Oh, no. You move someplace nice. Start fishing every day, buy you a boat, get a routine down over there. Somewhere. No, 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 no. That is not the case. This wasn't David's first rodeo. Did you know that? He's prayed this many times over. Look at verse 3. Thou hast proved, past tense, thou hast proved my heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shalt find nothing. I'm purpose that my mouth shall not transgress. He says, I'm no stranger to you, Lord. 
You have proved yourself to me in my heart. You've visited me in my times of darkness, my times of trouble before. You've visited me in mercy. You've come to me in grace. And each time, your grace has been sufficient. Lord, you have tried me and shall find none. How's that? What's the bifocal lens on that one? You found nothing when you looked at me. Well, one, you'll find the same thing I find. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I have nothing to bring. I have nothing to offer. Secondly, you visited me in that hour of darkness and night and you showed me that there's no condemnation. You've taken it away. He said, I purpose that my mouth shall not transgress. I'm determined not to charge you with folly, Lord, to only declare what you've done for me and for your people and your son, to glorify him and him only. I, that's my intent. That's my intent. That's what's put in my hand, and that's my intent. If, if somebody has questions and, and they have concerns, I don't want to tell you what I think. And rapid fire, real quick, we can get down to, well, the Lord says this, the Lord said this, the Scriptures say that. <laughs> Most people just give up and bow to what the Lord says, but I want to tell you what He said. I want to tell you what He's done. I want to tell you what His promises are. Job said, naked out of my mother's womb, I came naked, shall I return thither? The Lord gave, the Lord's taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And it says, in, in all this, Job sinned not nor char charge God with folly, with foolishness. He told the truth, didn't he? Well, verse 4, we see David's, this great king's dependency. He said, Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips I have kept me from the paths of the destroyers. David prays throughout the Psalms, and he goes from one word of praise and joy directly to weakness and need. And then right back, he goes right back to confidence and contentment, doesn't he? Ups and downs, ups and downs, real fast. I need to see David go through that. I need to see that because that's how I feel in this world. One moment I could move mountains, bear the winds of any storm, strong. Oh, take three breaths. Lord, is the, are the heavens brass? Are all my prayers just bouncing off of you? Has your mercies clean gone forever? And then, no, they ain't. I know his promises. <laughs> it's an emotional roller coaster sometimes. Isn't it? That's a roller coaster for you. I know the works of men. I'm familiar with their ways. I know what they are all about. And I know the only reason I ain't just like them. The only reason I'm not just like them is the word of your lips. You've kept me from the past of the destroyer. You've commanded it. And you've promised it, and I can read it. Do you know what a privilege that is? When we turn to a scripture, let's, let's see what the Lord says about it. We can pick this up and look at it. Oh, what a, what a privilege He's given us. If we could hear Him speak when He does it. There's people that worship the Bible. They don't worship the God of the Bible. They worship the scriptures. They don't worship the Christ of scriptures. I want to see Him in them. David says, if it wasn't for your command, your promises, I would have went the way that all natural men go. I would have walked according to the course of this world right in the hands of the destroyer. And it's so common people think that that's drugs and alcohol and rock and roll and uh, uh, saying curse words and living an unclean life. Oh no, that's robes in the highest rooms of the religious courts. He said, your word kept me. Turn to Psalm 119. Let's see what other, other times that David's prayed this. Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 9. He says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. What's his commandments? His word. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord. Teach me. 
thy statutes. Teach me your word. Teach me what it means. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. What comes out of his mouth? His word does. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies of your word. As much as in all riches. I will meditate on thy precepts, your word. And have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. In your word. I will not forget thy word. That's what David's saying here in our text. Your word, O Lord, has kept me. It's kept me. The power of your word is what's kept me. And that's what I desire to learn. I want to be taught about your word. That's what I rejoice in. That's what I meditate on. And that's what I delight in. What you have to say about it. The verdict that comes down from your throne. That's what I want to hear. I want to know. Now back in our text in Psalm 17. Here's what David asked for. He prays in verse 1 to the Holy Lord. But he asks here in verse 5. Psalm 17, 5. Hold up my goings in thy paths that my footsteps slip not. Hold me up. Hold me up. That's present tense. He didn't say, Lord, you've held me up before. He didn't say tomorrow, Lord, you can hold me up if it pleases you. Yesterday's not here and tomorrow's not promised. I need held up right now. I need thee every hour. Hold up my goings. Where? <laughs> In thy paths. In his way. Not my way. Not, Lord, well, can you just keep me going in this direction I've determined to go in. It'd be nice if you helped me. No, Lord, keep me in thy paths. Hold me in your paths. The Lord has to teach that. Do you know that? To teach us to ask for His will to be done. If we pray, Lord, your will be done, guess what? Earnestly, every prayer you ever pray is going to be answered because <laughs> His will is going to be done in it. David said in Psalm 18, he said, As for God, His way is perfect. A child of God quickly learns that the Lord's way, His path, is perfect. Ours is the path that leads to death. What I'd really like to happen, it, what would make me just real happy, is probably not the way to go. What my desire is, what I think will work out real well, is the path that leads to destruction. Solomon told us that. He said, the way, there's a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Our master said, enter ye into the straight gates, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go therein. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life. And few there be that find it. Well, if there's a, a narrow gate and a narrow way, I'm going to have to be led on that path. <laughs> I could wander from it. Lord, hold me in your paths. One translator had said, a commentator on the scriptures, when you hold me in thy ways, is that it's like a, a stagecoach going down a steep hill and the person with the reins guiding the horses. I'm just a horse with slick shoes. <laughs> hold me in thy paths, Lord. Verse 17, or chapter 17, verse 5 says, Hold me up my goings, hold me up my goings in thy paths that my footsteps slip not. David, this great king, a man after God's own heart. Boy, he's something, wasn't he? He did not presume. It's easy for those saved by grace to get complacent, to become real comfortable, to become assuming. That's one reason the Lord sends us trying times. Do you know that? When I think, well, i got a good handle on this. When I get real complacent. Well, I know these things. I've known these things for decades. And I have. The Lord might send a trial to make me bow to Him. To make me cry out, hold me right now. Not you have held me. You've held me for decades. Hold me right now, Lord. He'll send a trial for that. Look over Psalm 107. Psalm 107, verse 23. Psalm 107, 23 says, They that go down in the sea in the ships do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. Why do they see His wonders? How do they see these things? 
Because, 4, verse 25, For He commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. How are you going to see the deep things of the Lord? The Lord's going to send a storm and He's going to shake you up. And He's going to send you so high up and so, high, so low down and all the way to the left and all the way to the right where you're at your wit's end you can't take no more. I've been in my wit's end recently. And that's a wonderful thing if God sends it. Why? Verse 28, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and He bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So He bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness. What's the goodness of the Lord? Well, He commanded and raised the stormy winds, didn't He? The storm was just as important as the landing on dry ground. That's how we truly are made glad and quiet and for His wonderful works to the children of men. People want to see the works of the Lord in deep, the deep ways. They're going to have to go through some, some strong storms way up high, way down low, to and fro, tossed, and they feel like their feet slipping away. I'm going on a slippery slope. You ever felt that way? They'll have to go through those things to appreciate the calm that only God can give. They're going to have to feel them feet slipping and sliding to feel how steady that rock is underneath us. Turn to Mark chapter 4. This is what not only David's, <laughs> David's experience other than the Lord's children's experiences too. Mark chapter 4. When there's absolutely no other place, person, to plead for help, when everything's taken away, we cry to Him. And He speaks peace. Mark 4 verse 36. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took Him even as He was in the ship, and there was also with Him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, care, carest thou not that we perish? Was this a bad storm? Let me tell you how bad this storm was. Commercial fishermen thought they was going to die. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, they didn't before they called to him. And they said, Lord, don't you care? We're going to die. Peace, be still. That came first, didn't it? And then he looked to his children. And he said, what's wrong with you? Why are you, why are you afraid? Why don't you have any faith? Now they got some. <laughs> you can, to know about something and to have a personal understanding of it are two totally different things. To know about a place and to be at that place... <laughs> It's totally different. Idea versus experience is way di different and everybody knows it. I saw in this movie once, I didn't like the movie, but it had a good, good illustration in it. This man was teaching a bunch of rescue swimmers about hypothermia. And they had a big pool and he kept putting ice in it, kept putting ice in it, kept putting ice in it. And they were all in it and they were shaking. And he was talking to them. And that one said, I'm not tired no more. I've experienced it. He said, all the blood's running from your extremities to your organs right before you die. That's what's happening. Well, the boss come in, the colonel come in. So what are y'all doing? So he jumps out of the pool and they said, he said, you're supposed to be teaching these boys about hypothermia. And he goes, in about two and a half minutes, they're going to understand it. <laughs> 
We ain't gonna get if we're, if we're the Lord's children, He teaches us. It ain't gonna be just a book knowledge. It ain't gonna be just a head knowledge. We want experience. We want experience. Back in our text, or in Psalm seventeen, I'll hurry. Psalm seventeen, verse six says, "I have called upon Thee, for Thou wilt hear me, O God." Incline thine ear unto me and hear my speech. How will David know the Lord heard him? What's the Lord going to show David if he hears him? Verse 7, show thy marvelous loving kindness. O thou that savest by the right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. There must have been a time that that marvelous loving kindness wasn't shown, huh? That happens. That happens. The Lord takes His countenance from us sometimes, we think. We think He's clean left us. Isaiah wrote of that. The Lord spoke to him and said, For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. A little wrath, I hide my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. That's necessary sometimes. If the Lord shows something to somebody... The Lord don't audibly speak to no one anymore. The apostolic era is over. That needs said. But if the Lord's going to show somebody something, if the Holy, Holy Spirit's going to come to someone and, and, and work in them and express something to them, this is what it's going to do. Show me my, thy marvelous loving kindness. Where's all of the Father's marvelous loving kindness at in His Son? And it says, O oh, thou that savest by the right hand. That right hand of power, yes, but that's also the one that's at His right hand. That's how he's saved. To them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. Those that put their trust in you and not in those rising up against us. Quit looking at them. Leave them alone. Quit talking about it. That's what we're rejoicing in if that's all we talk about. Don't look at our enemies. Look at the one that saved us from our enemies. It also could be translated those that rise up against Christ rise up against his people. And that's true. Verse 8 says, keep me as the apple of the eye. The apple of the eye. The eye is the most protected part of the body. Wait 25 years till this. The eye is the most protected part of the body. We don't look like frogs or spiders, do we? They're not bugging out. We have a brow to keep the sweat out. We have lashes to keep the dirt and the dust out. We have tear ducts to keep it moist. The skulls build around it. You have a brow, you have a... A cheekbone extends out. A fast eyelid to cover it. And the pupil. The apple is the pupil. That's the centermost part. The most protected of the eye. It's almost like the whole head's built around it, isn't it? My pastor preached on that. Right as I was going through it in biology class. And I didn't think till the other day, me and Luke Coffey both had Miss Vincent for biology our freshman year. <laughs> he probably told his grandpa that evening. David says, keep me as the apple of the eye. Hedge me about in all my ways is what he's saying. Circle me around. Protect me in every way imaginable. Every way needed. Verse 8. Keep me as the apple of thy eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. We know the Lord says about hens and those little chickens that come under the shadow of the wings. I thought, you know, those cherubims, they had two wings. Two that covered their eyes, two that covered their feet, two that come out over top of that mercy seat. That's where I want to be hid. I want to be in that mercy seat. I want to be covered and protected in there. Verse 9, From the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who compass me about. After all this calling on the Lord, David describes those against him. It says in verse 10, They are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. They have now compassed us. In our steps. Ah, oh, he's not alone, is he? Something's changed. <laughs> Something's changed in him, hasn't it? They have, not, have now compassed us in our steps. They've set their eyes bowing down to the earth. They're about to attack. You know, that's a, <clears throat> a sheep that's timid will look down to the ground. A sinner that's had a broken heart that shut up to sin will keep their eyes down to the earth, won't they? They'll be brought to bow. They'll be brought down. But you know what else does that? It looks exactly the same. 
is a bull or a ram. I'll look at you and they'll put them heads down. What are they going to do? They're about to charge, ain't they? Looks the same. Heart's different in them. Verse 12 says, Like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places, now call for defense. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him. Cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. Your word's what's going to do it, Lord. Lord, you defeat our enemies. If we're one with him, those that are against Christ are against us. And those that are against us are against him, ain't they? That's our enemy. He's the defender. He's our shield. He's our buckler. And it's his sword that's going to be used. His word's going to go out and protect his people. Just like Michael, the archangel, contended with Satan over the body of Moses. And he didn't say, you get away from me. And here's, you do this and you do that and you're wrong. And here's why. He said, the Lord rebuke thee. What wisdom. He is our defense. Verse 14 says, From men which are thy hand, O Lord, from men of the world, which have their portion in this life. It's so easy to be frustrated with people that the Lord hasn't worked in yet. It's so easy to be frustrated with those successful and their eyes bug out with fatness in this world. I got good advice long ago. Leave them alone. This is all they have. This is all they have. And then they'll enter eternity without Christ. And whose belly thou fillest with the hid treasure. They are full of children and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. They live a big inheritance. Don't be mad at them. Have pity on them. Have pity on them. I don't like those though. (laughs) You've worked in me, Lord. You've sent trials to me, waves and storms and Enemies to compass us about. You show me these things. You come to me in the night. I'm not like those men. You've made me to differ. You have made me to differ. Verse 15, ask for me. Not like them, ask for me. I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I wake with thy likeness. How did David arrive at looking to the resurrection at the end of this? (laughs) <laughs> we started out rough, didn't we? And so now, now, Lord, on, on behalf of your son, you hear me, because I need heard. And you have helped me. And you've come to me at night. And you've been with me. And you've comforted me. And your grace has been sufficient. But I petition you now, Lord, hold me in your ways today. Be with me. He talks a little bit about that enemy. Boy, how quick. I'm mean, after one verse. It's our enemy. You'll deal with them. You'll disappoint them. You'll do that. I feel sorry for them. I have pity for them, Lord. If it pleases you, if it's in your paths, you reveal yourself to them. Let me comfort them after you do so. But as for me, I'll behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I wake with thy likeness. He knows and desires unity with Christ. The enemy that surrounds us, he prays, Lord, your will be done in justice. But I seek, I seek your face. My end goal, my end state, what I want to be like is be like you. I want to be with you and I want to be made like you. Now if we end up there, if we begin with Christ and end up being one made like him, you think that trial we're currently in may just ease a little bit? (laughs) You think if he teaches us to pray, now he's going to have to send the trial to teach us how to pray. But if we're focused on Him in the beginning, we remember all of His blessings of time past, the promises He's given us. Lord, hold me in Your path now. Keep me like an apple in Your eye in the future and make me just like Your Son and and let me dwell with Him forever. I don't care that breaker caught on fire on my well pump. I'll get over it. (laughs) I know my leg's sore. I'll have a new leg. That'll be fine. That'll help, won't it? I want to pray that way. Do you? I hope we can. All right. Father, on the name of your Son, on his merit, his person, his work, what he's accomplished in and for his people, Lord, we petition you to stay with us as you've promised. 
Lord, keep us as the apple of your eye. Hedge us about, protect us, and give